the environment that creates your images. So it's, it's totally, it's totally uh, detached. But, well, this terminology is not that important. Um, so the question is, how does, this, how does this function? And then we have to go back to how people, I mean, philosophers, psychologists, neuroscientists, view the general functioning of the brain. I mean, we, with new neuroimaging techniques, we know more and more about where certain things are happening in the brain. But this doesn't tell us too much about what is happening, uh, and, and particularly it doesn't tell us very much about how it is happening. Yeah? And we have, during history, used all kinds of metaphors for understanding what is happening in the brain. And maybe the oldest one is from Aristotle, who, who thought of the brain as a cooling system. I mean, it wasn't even a cognitive, cognitive uh, system. It was something. I mean, all the cognition and emotions were in the heart. Uh, and the brain was only a cooling system for the, uh, for the blood. Maybe not such an interesting function for the, for the brain. We've changed. And the early cognitive scientists in the 50s and the 60s, uh, way in, in maybe to some extent even now, tended to think of the brain as a computer. I mean, we, we had in the 40s, the, we, we saw the development of the von Neumann or the Turing machine, I mean, the computational mechanism. And it was a very strong belief uh, among some scientists, that this was a very good metaphor, a very good description of how the brain functions. And people started looking for the central processor of the brain and where the long-term memory stores and the short-term memory stores and input and output channels and whatnot. I mean, they took this metaphor of the brain as a computer very seriously. It didn't work very well. And, and in the uh, 70s, it was replaced by, by um, uh, an, another metaphor, the brain as a system of parallel processors. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you can describe it as an ant hill. Each neuron is an ant and it sends out the informations all over the place uh, via, via, via synapses and so on. So that was a, a, a different view on the computation of the, of the brain. But still the brain was thought of as a computational system. And maybe that's a, a, a metaphor, a paradigm that is influential in many areas of, of cognitive neuroscience at the moment. There were other uh, uh, proposals in the 60s. Carl Prebram uh, proposed that the brain has the same mechanism functions in the same way as a hologram uh, functions. This metaphor never really took off the ground, and I, I don't know if, it's, uh, if it's still, anybody is still working along with it. But that, that was another, another mechanism for understanding the brain. And recently, I mean, the last 10, 15 years, we've seen, no, oh, I forgot about Edelman. I mean, he saw the brain as an immune system. I mean, that's a, a, another way of, of, of looking at the brain. Uh, I don't know how much that tells us about the, uh, uh, the thinking. But the last 10 years, and this is the metaphor I will focus on, viewing the brain as a control system. People take ideas from control theory and, and view, uh, view the brain as a set of feedback and feed-forward mechanisms and, and with loops and, 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 and so on. I will introduce you to some of the basic ideas of control <laughs> theory. So, according to this idea, uh, well, if you go from sensations to perceptions, there are things in the brain, I mean, this is part of the control theoretical metaphor, that work as simulators. We have mechanisms that are processes running coordinations between the senses and the motor, motor systems. But there are also systems that run uh, in parallel with this. So if you look at the sensory motor loop, I mean, you have the motor cortex sending out signals to the muscles. There is a feedback from the muscles, and, and it's brought back to the brain. And this is a loop when we, when we perform uh, movements. Um, the problem, one problem with this loop is that it's comparatively slow. It takes about four or 500 milliseconds for, for this loop to, to be fulfilled. So sometimes when we're solving certain problems, this loop is too slow to give us feedback. So, uh, I'm sorry, I should say something. I'm sorry, it works, I mean, this is a simple, a simple feedback loop from control theory. We have a goal, we want to reach something with our hand or throw something with our hands, and we send it out to the muscles, something happens, we, we, via the senses, we measure the results, we see whether we hit what we are reaching for or, or not. I mean, I'm reaching for, for the glass or whatever. There is a feedback loop, and you make a comparison between what you want and what you, what you see, what you receive, and then this comparison then 
uh, gets out the second time into the system and so on. There is a feedback loop. And what you would want to do is to minimize the, the difference between what you want and what you, what, what you get, so to speak. This is a simple loop. But the problem is that very often this loop is slow, too slow for motor, motor control. So, in the brain, I mean, some people have been speculating and there seems to be fairly good evidence when it comes to motor control that we have a simulator, a system that runs in parallel, that simulates the consequences of what we are, what we are, uh, um, thing, uh, what we are wanting to do, and then guesses what will be the result and uses this guess as a feedback to the mechanism. I will come back to the control theoretic aspects of this in a while. But my parallel here is that this is what gives us the sensation, the, the feedback from the body. And we are complementing it by a lot of simulations. And that, that is what fills in the perceptions. So a perception is the sensation plus what is uh, the result of the simulations in, 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 in the brain. And I will give you some arguments for what, that we have these kinds of simulators. And of course, the imaginations are then the pure simulations. I mean, just simulations without any sensory uh, feedback. So what I call imaginations is just running the simulators and, and, and nothing else. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about this as a control theoretical model. I mean, it's a, it's a metaphor like all the other metaphors I talked about. But let's see what we can do with this metaphor. I mean, this is my, my, one of my purposes uh, with this talk. So, uh, okay. Uh, this is another more complicated. I'm not giving you a course on control theory. But the idea is that instead of having a, f a simple feedback loop, you throw in, uh, okay, in, in, in control theory, it's very often called an emulator. I call it a simulator. But you have something that running in, in parallel with the process. You have a process emulator. And this is what really gives the output. I mean, the real output is from here. And then, of course, you get the feedback from the real process. But this feedback is much slower. But anyway, you make a comparison between what the simulator says and what reality says. And this difference is then put in via, I mean, this is a theoretical notion I don't want to talk about, the Kalman filter, that teaches the process emulator, that changes it in the long run. And this, this change is slow. I mean, it's after a lot of trials. I mean, you're, if you're throwing darts or whatever, you have to have a lot of practice. Uh, you have, you're aiming at something, your simulation says that you will hit the bullseye, but in practice you don't, and uh, next time there, there is a large difference between your aim and your result. So s the, the difference will tell your body to change your position next time you throw. And after a while, I mean after lots of attempts, the emulator will have built up some kind of fairly realistic process of what goes on. And these are the emulators that fill in, in the perceptions. Let me give you some simple examples. Do you see the triangle? There is no triangle. I mean, this is something that your brain constructs very rapidly. You have this line segment and that line segment, and the brain makes a hypothesis that this, this one is connected to that one. You tend to see some kind of distinction here in the white. There is nothing. I mean, there is just pure white. But your brain is adding an interpretation. Part of the simulator looking for straight lines, I mean, building up straight lines, gives you the triangle on top. And, you, and similarly, you tend to see this as complete circles, I mean, hidden by the, hidden by the uh, uh, triangle. These are totally unconscious simulators, and the visual, process, uh, visual uh, processes are full of these simulators. Let me give you one more example, more, more drastic. I hope, I think you can see lots of circles of this size. There are smaller circles as well. I mean, they're all over the place once you see them. Uh, the circles don't exist. I mean, there are only dots on, on, on the picture. Your brain is filling in the pattern. And I think that, I hope, that you see this pattern as moving. As, your, as you move your attention over the place, the, the, the circles are changing all the time. So it's a dynamic picture. Of course, the picture is not changing. It's, it's perfectly still here. It's your brain that is adding interpretations of these pictures uh, all the time. So this is viewing the simulation process as going on in, in, the, in, the, um, in the brain. So when, when it comes to the visual process, we know that our, the brain is full of mechanisms that fill in the sensations that we get. I mean, my elephant example is, is, is another one, but it's on a higher level because it, it consists of a more holistic pattern and an elephant that you have learned to, to recognize, uh, mainly from pictures, I think, maybe from uh, real encounters as, uh, uh, as well. 
Now, when it comes to low-level processes, we know a little bit about how these simulation, these filling-in processes work. When it comes to higher cognitive functions, we know very little.